a friend and a colleague of mine used to say, if everything is urgent, then nothing is urgent. If everything's a priority, then nothing is a priority. And that's true, I think. One of the hardest things that you and I encounter, one of the hardest things to do sometimes, especially when we get busy juggling life and we're trying to keep all these different balls in the air, is to discern priorities, is to figure out what is truly and what is most important. And if that's the case for you, or if you can relate to that in any way, then prayerfully you're going to be blessed today as we take a look at a particular verse out of Proverbs 4, and that's the 23rd verse, Proverbs 4, 23. It's couched in the midst of a lot of verses which amount to the counsel of a wise father to a son. And yet it starts out or seems in some way to be a beginning point for him and for us as a priority, something that must be in order if the rest of the counsel from Proverbs 4 is to be heeded. The NIV does a good job uh, capturing the importance of this verse in translation. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So the title of today's message is Priority One, Keeping the Heart. If all goes according to plan, although it seldom does, this will be the first of two messages on this particular proverb. Today we're going to deal primarily with the why of the command. Why is this in here? Why does it matter? What is this text saying to us? And next week, we'll deal with the how. Let's pray. Father, again, we submit ourselves to your word. We come here to sit under it. We come here to hear from you. We want to know your truth. We want it to inform our lives. We want it to shape our thinking. We want it to grow our faith. We do ask, as Steve has already prayed, that you might deliver us from the distractions. We have several preoccupations always as we come into this place, things we're concerned about, things that invade our minds. Give us the grace, we pray, in the time ahead to turn our whole heart to you and hear what you have to say for us. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what is this verse telling us to do? Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The object of the command is quite obviously the heart. When we think of the heart in Scripture, we're not thinking about that blood pumping organ, right, that keeps us all alive. We all know about that heart, the one that when it stops, we stop. We're talking about something different than that. What is the heart in Scripture? The heart is the place where we think. It's our inner life. It's our mind. It's our motives. It's a place where uh, our beliefs are stored. It's, it's the repository of everything that we trust in, uh, of our treasures. There's so many ways to describe the heart. It is kind of who we are, and as we shall see, it is from which everything flows. The primary command in this verse is to keep. And that is not to keep as in to possess. Remember when we were kids and we found something that we liked and we said, find your keeper. Kind of like, this belongs to me now. That's not what that means. To keep means to protect. It means to preserve. It means to maintain. So, so what we're being told here is protect your heart, preserve your heart, maintain your heart. What it tells us straight away is that the heart is valuable. You might wonder, well, how do we get that out of this little verse? Well, it's implied in the command for the heart to be guarded. You're to protect, preserve, to maintain something. It has to be valued. Nobody guards worthless things, do they? You don't guard worthless things. We don't care about things that don't have value. We don't care what happens to them. They can be stolen. They can be lost. They can be damaged, and it doesn't matter. You don't stand guard over the trash bags that you haul out to the curb hoping that somebody someday will come and haul them off. Some of you have vehicles that you leave the keys in. You hope somebody takes that vehicle <laughs> so that you can get rid of it because it doesn't mean anything to you. You're not watching over that. You're not guarding it. Why? Because it doesn't have value. We value, we guard and watch over the things that are valuable. Okay. When this was written, the... Uh, the notion of a city wall and city gates would have been common to folks who were reading it. We don't have any appreciation for that today. We don't have city walls. We don't have city gates. We don't have people standing on a wall looking out, trying to protect Ellsworth, making sure who comes in or who goes out. The closest we ever get to anything like that around here are security guards. 
And we also uh, have now security systems. Some of you might actually have some security systems. What's it for? It's to protect the things that are valuable to you, the things that matter. It used to be a, an annual occurrence, pretty much, sad to say, but in our shared mission called Baptist Youth Camp down in Charlotte, Maine, our youth camp down there, we would regularly cut wood, split wood, and stack wood through the season. Trees that had fallen down, trees that needed to be cleared out uh, to make ways for other programming areas. Anyway, we would have regularly a stack of wood every summer. And just about every winter, that wood would make its way into some unknown person's truck or trailer and eventually stole. In other words, it was stolen all the time. And you know what? It was one of those losses that we were willing to endure because, you know, as Christians, we did the work, but we figure if someone's willing to pull into Baptist Youth Camp and steal our wood, they must need it a lot more than we do. That's really not a problem. Actually, if they'd asked, we would just have given it to them. But anyway, that's kind of beside the point. A few years ago, actually, it's probably a lot longer than that. Now, do you find that you don't have any track of time anymore? The older you get, it's like, was that last year? Yeah, that was a decade ago. And that probably is the truth. Uh, a long time ago, BYC was vandalized. It wasn't just that somebody pulled in there to take the wood. They drove a car around the field. They made ruts all over the place. They kicked in doors, left trash around. At that point, those of us who are responsible for the camp decided we need to do a better job of stewarding it. We have to, we have to take care of it. We have to watch over it. Nobody's down there full time. It's just way down in Charlotte, Maine, and we don't ask people to keep a close eye on it, so what do we do? We got a security system. And we put up all the signs also that say that we have a security system so that people would know. And I'm happy to report that by the grace of God and Black Bear Security, BYC has, has not had any more of those sort of incidents. You take care of what you value, you guard what matters to you. And there was just too much down there for us not to look out for it, not to watch over it. And so the scripture here is saying, Guard your heart, keep your heart, because it is important, it is precious, it is valuable, it's worth tending, it's worth keeping. Next we see in this verse a qualifier for how this keeping is to be done. This is a strengthening of the command. The command isn't just keep your heart, but it's keep your heart with all vigilance. The original language translated here, vigilance, has that same connotation, that same idea of watching, of guarding over something or someone. King James Version says, keep your heart with all diligence. The God's Word translation says, guard your heart more than anything else. And I think that really gets at the gist of what we're being told here. Guard your heart more than anything else. You're, in all your keeping, keep this. In all your watching, make sure you watch this. We can keep an eye on a lot of things in our journey through life, don't we? And the scripture is saying, but make sure out of all that you're keeping an eye on, you keep an eye on your heart more than anything else. Now, why do you suppose this command is in here? Why do you suppose that the heart requires such diligent oversight? It's because, I think, the heart is impressionable. And implied in that, it's the heart is vulnerable. There's a young man here in Proverbs chapter 4, and if he's simple and unformed and immature, and we believe he is, then he doesn't know how susceptible he is to believing lies. He doesn't know how easy it's going to be for him to be deceived. He doesn't know how prone he is to entering into misguided allegiances. How exposed he is to the destructive power of placing his trust in people who don't deserve it. Placing his trust in things that, that, that won't bear up, that don't deserve it. Last week we saw how the fool uh, is already overconfident. He's reckless, he's careless, he's not able to spot danger, but the wise, the wise person, can do that, and that's what's happening here. This dad, this writer, is trying to shape the simple and help him to be wise and help him to avoid foolishness. That's what this is, right? Remember, Proverbs, most of Proverbs, a lot of Proverbs, is a letter from a dad to a son. And what this dad wants his son to know, what he's telling his son, what any parent would, would want their child to know, what any pastor would tell his flock, be careful what you give your heart. Very practical advice. Be careful what you give your heart to. Few things are going to be worthy of your heart. 
and God should always have first place in it. And yet there's going to be so much competition out there for your affection, for your attention. So, so this tells us be on the lookout for that. Be careful of that. Be advised. It was a Puritan, John Flavel, who said, and I think this is something that he learned by observation and experience. He said, the greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God and after conversion to keep it with him. Did you hear that? The greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God and after conversion to keep it with him. That it's a struggle sometimes for us to be faithful. This isn't just automatic. It doesn't always just fall into place. It isn't always going to be easy. The youngster in Proverbs 4 could not fully appreciate this sort of struggle that is going to come upon him. He doesn't understand yet the strength and the lure of sin. He doesn't grasp fully. He can't. He hasn't grown into it yet. The bent of the human heart to do what is wrong. Which is the Apostle Paul says that in Romans 7, right? The very things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do, wretched man that I am. This is life in a fallen condition that we're fighting this all the time. And this young guy does not know that. How many of us have, have at some point been truly surprised by something that we said or something that we did that we know is so out of line? We just can't. <laughs> Never is the answer, right? I'm so happy for you, brother. <laughs> Okay, let me just confess, you know. And I mean truly surprised that we, that we, you know, God-fearing good people would be capable of such words or such deeds. This young man wouldn't understand that strength of sin, nor would he have an appreciation for his spiritual enemy. Who is this devil? He doesn't know. Who is this adversary that Peter would later describe as a devil? prowling around, seeking to devour whom he met. The hymn writer got it right, I think, the, in a song made most famous by the late Billy Graham Crusades. We listened to it to begin our worship this morning, just as I am, that we all have fightings and fears within, without. That, what that means is we meet temptation coming and going. That's what we do. That's the human life. You meet temptation coming and going. You're not going to be separated from it. You're not going to be able to avoid it all the time. And you've got to guard your heart. Because your heart is a target of that temptation. And if you leave your heart unprotected, or if you carelessly regard that heart, you just leave it out there, it's vulnerable. You know this, don't you? You know this. Your heart is easily wounded. And your heart can be frequently broken. And it's just more deceived than you want to admit. And, and then, be careful of this, really. Then it's prone to hardening. So the heart must be kept with all vigilance because it is valuable and because it is vulnerable. And as I was putting this message together, I thought, my goodness, valuable, vulnerable? That's like two, two, two that begin with the same letter. There's a literary device called alliteration. I rarely use it, but I thought, hey, there's got to be another B word out there somewhere. <laughs> So that everybody will think I'm really smart and cool. I came up with three V letter. I found one. I mean, it didn't make it up. It's a real word, and it fits. The third point here. The heart must be kept because it is valuable, it is vulnerable, but it is vital. That's what this text teaches. Yeah, ooh. Who would be appropriate at this point? Yeah, ooh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life heart couldn't be more vital. The heart is the source of life. It is from the heart that our attitudes, words, and deeds flow. Now, I just ask you, have you ever said something or done something? Maybe you just blurted something out only to realize how inappropriate it was, or you just went ahead and, and a, a seemingly mild offense or a mild inconvenience, and you just lose your mind over it? You just go ballistic. And, and, and and if you do that, or when you've done that, what do you say? I don't know where that came from. Huh? Come on now. How many of you? I'm the only one again. Okay. That's what we say. That's what we say. I don't know where that came from. That came out of the blue. 
I do not know where that came from. I can tell you where it came from. I want to tell you where it came from, and I can tell you this with confidence because it's not me knowing you so well to know where that came from. It's God knowing us so well to tell us in his word where it came from. It came from your heart. And Jesus taught about this when he was clarifying a point in the law, Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. He said, there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled. What comes out of a person is what defiles him, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile the person. Jesus also said, and it's recorded in Luke 6, verses 43 to 45, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good, and the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A person's heart is the source of that person's thoughts, words, and deeds. Now, does that mean if you speak harshly or if you act badly at some point that you are not a Christian? I mean, you may hear that and go, oh my goodness, maybe I'm a bad tree. Because Sometimes I produce bad fruit. Does this mean that Christ is not in your heart? It could. I suppose it could. But mostly, most likely it does not. I don't know if you have figured this out or not, uh, but Christians are not perfect. Some of you have figured it out, yes. We don't always say what we ought to say. We don't always do we ought to do. Sin will fail. We're not perfect. But that sin doesn't mean that we're not saved. We're not treating it lightly. We're not dismissing it. We're not justifying it. We're not pretending it's okay to sin. But it doesn't mean we're not saved. But, but it, what it does mean is this. When we speak that way, when we act that way, it means that something's wrong in it's an indication that right now, presently, something's wrong inside. Because understand, beloved, sin comes from a disordered heart. Sin comes from a disordered heart. So if we are easily angered, or sharply critical, or, or passive-aggressive, if we are prone to gossip, if we are selfish, if we are manipulative, if we are controlling, it, I, this list could go on and on and on. These are cues that something is wrong with us at the heart level. That the affections of our hearts have become misdirected. That we have subtly and probably unintentionally become more concerned with what we want than what God wants. And now we are speaking and behaving so as to get our own way. Let me repeat that. We have subtly and probably unintentionally become more concerned with what we want than what God wants. And we are speaking and behaving so as to get our own way. I was blessed this past February to go to a biblical counseling conference, faith counseling conference out in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. And at this conference, one of the speakers was a fellow named Dr. Brent, Brent Oakwin. And uh, Dr. Oakwin was a rocket scientist. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I never met a rocket scientist before. I mean, never really met him, but he studied this stuff. His desire, his dream was to be an astronaut. And so he did all the studying that he had to do to become one of those aerospace engineer type of things. And he stood there in front of us in this conference and he says, listen, I'm telling you right now, I'm a rocket scientist. Impressive, right? He says, and this biblical counseling thing, I can tell you, it's not rocket science. 
It was very, very reassuring that, that the God's Word is sufficient to address our issues and tell us what's going on. It's not rocket science. It's right here in front of us. And he was teaching us on the heart, teaching from a passage in James. But he laid this out more simply than I've ever heard anybody lay it out, and so I'm going to share it with you. This would be a great takeaway for today. It answers that question, you know, why do I do what I do, or where did that come from? He says this. We do what we do because we want what we want. Now, that may seem so simple, but just if you want to lay that out over everything that you're up to, it really reveals your motives, doesn't it? It really reveals your heart. We do what we do because we want what we want. We get confused because we don't always know what we want. That's a separate sermon. We do what we do because we want what we want. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why can't I stop saying these things? Why do I act the way that I do? Because your heart's desire is coming out of your mouth. Because what's in your heart is coming out of your face. Coming out of your hands, coming out of your eyes. Your behavior exposes your true priorities. It reveals them. The words that we use, the actions we choose, testify to what's going on in here. Not just in regards to salvation, but also in regards to where we are presently in terms of being lined up with God and its good purposes for us. And by the way, if you're here today, you're not satisfied with your words, you're not satisfied with your actions, if you sense that they are unbefitting of a Christian, if you're frustrated by your inability to change where you know you ought to be changing, if you're convicted about any of this, let me just encourage you, can we talk about it? That's it. Would you call me? Would you text me? Would you email me? Can we talk about it? You're not the only one going through this. You're not the only one who has this anger or these issues. You're not the only one who worries inordinately or behaves in ways that you know fall short of the glory of God. Romans tells us it, for all have sinned. We're not making light of it. Jesus died to pay for it. But the human condition is that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So why would you suffer alone? Why would you keep trying in your own strength to make this happen? Talk to to somebody. Work on this. God has so much more for you than to suffer alone. press this point just a little bit further for today, then we'll we'll be done. Solomon likens the heart to a water spring. Anybody familiar with a refreshing water spring? Anybody? Yeah, like some of you have camps and you draw water from a spring. Some of you may have springs near your homes. We we are around here blessed with lots of those. And and think about a water spring in the arid climate of the Middle East. It's essentially a liquid gold mine. If you've got a spring that's going to consistently put forth clear, cold, refreshing water, it's a liquid gold mine. It's going to take care of your family. It's going to take care of your flocks. It can even take care of an entire region. But think of a spring, though, that is polluted or contaminated, one that is bitter, like the one that the Israelites came upon as they left, as they began their journey, they come across a bitter spring. What is that? That's a curse. That's a tease. That's useless. And a spring is going to be either one or the other, right? It's either going to be really good or it's going to be no good. James 3.11 asks this, Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? And what's the answer? No. No, a spring does not pour forth both fresh and salt water. A spring will either be good or it will be no good. A good spring blesses. It refreshes everybody who drinks of it. A contaminated spring sickens and it poisons everybody who drinks from it. Now that's imagery that we kind of understand around here in a land of many springs. But Charles Spurgeon, when he was 23 years old, seemed to have had the sense that all his London parishioners might not grasp it. And so he put it to them this way, trying to get at what Solomon is talking about. He said, you have seen the great reservoirs provided by our water company in which the water is to supply hundreds of streets and thousands of houses is kept. Now, the heart is just the reservoir of man, and our life is allowed to flow in its proper season. That life may flow through different pipes, the mouth, the hand, the eye, but still, all the issues 
of the hand of eye of lip, derive their source from the great fountain and central reservoir, the heart. And hence there is no difficulty in showing the great necessity that exists for keeping this reservoir, the heart, in a proper state and condition, since otherwise that which flows through the pipes must be touted and corrupt. So we see the great necessity for keeping the heart. Spurgeon would say it's like protecting the water supply. We grasp the idea of protecting the water supply because it is out of the heart that everything proceeds and everything is impacted by it. The heart shapes our actions. It's that simple. But it doesn't just stop there. It's not only about us. Our hearts are vital to us, yes. They're vital to our physical well-being, our spiritual well-being, our emotional well-being. But did you consider that our hearts, the condition of our hearts, are vital to the well-being of others? are vital to the people that we love the most, interact with the most, spend the most time with. Because, and this is a point that's already been made, right? What is unseen and what is unheard, hidden in our hearts, is eventually going to be seen and eventually going to be heard. It's going to come out in our words and it's going to come out in our conduct. Think about it like this, beloved. Our hearts are always gushing something. They really are. They're always gushing something. They're always pushing forth something. And those who are closest to us, or anyone downstream from the fountainhead of our hearts, is going to either be refreshed or contaminated. It is the condition of our hearts that determines whether we are a blessing or a burden to our spouse. It is the condition of our hearts that determines whether we are a help or a harm to our children. It is a condition of our hearts that determines whether we are the employer everyone wants to work for or the one everyone despises. It is a condition of our hearts that determines whether we are the employee everyone wants on staff or whether we are the person who brings the whole group down. You see it? It's a condition of our hearts that impacts everything. The heart is vital because it has everything to do with everything. Right? That's... It's that simple. It has everything to do with everything. Now, this is where we're going to leave off for now. And I trust and pray that this is an incredibly dissatisfying place to stop. Like we, well, well, we haven't gotten to the, yeah, you're right. I kind of hope that it's dissatisfying enough to make you say, well, I guess I get a, better get back here next week uh, and carry on. We have briefly covered the why of Proverbs 4.23 today. But next week, we will finish up, I think, if all goes well, and we'll look at the how. If keeping the heart is a top priority, and the Bible absolutely says it is, if it is a top priority, how exactly does one go about the business of keeping a heart? We're going to close our worship this morning with a prayer. Often we do with a song, but this morning we're just going to pray kind of a prayer for us and then a prayer for a particular special group of people. Uh, pray with me. Father, we have just now been contemplating the importance of guarding our hearts. And Lord, it is entirely possible we would confess that in the hustle and bustle that is our lives, we have been kind of caught in the flow of traffic, so to speak. We haven't really thought much about this. We'd be hard-pressed to say that we have made it a priority. So we want to thank you, Lord, for your gracious reminder, for your gentle and timely reminder to us this morning of the importance of guarding our hearts. And we pray, Father, that the truth of your word would resonate in us well beyond this time of worship, that we wouldn't just be leaving this in our seats as we walk away but that your spirit would help us to see what all this means for us. Have we kept our hearts well? Where are the breaches? What are the costs? What has to change? What can we do? Father, help us to think about these things today, this week, so that we can start to order our lives in the way that will honor you most and so that we can make first things first. If everything's the main thing, there's no main thing, but you've told us in your word what the main thing is. 
So help us, Father, we pray. As we think this morning about guarding our hearts, Lord, we also offer this prayer on behalf of our students. As they are now or will soon be returning to school. We pray that in the midst of the unique challenges in front of them, Lord, that their faith in you will sustain them. We pray that they will guard their hearts also and that they will gird their hearts with your truth. We ask you to bless them with wisdom that is necessary, that they might readily spot right from wrong, that they might be able to discern truth from error. We pray that what they have learned and what they have been taught by faithful families and loving churches will be brought to their remembrance in their times of need. Father, we rejoice to see our young ones growing and maturing. Sometimes we want to slow that process down. But we know it is the natural order of things, and it can be beautiful and wonderful. We pray that they will grow up to be willing instruments in your hands, that they will do wonderful work for your kingdom. Lord, with all the opportunities and the challenges and choices that confront our students today, we pray that you might help them to keep their eyes on you when they are prone to be distracted. For you are the one who has begun and has promised to finish the good work in them. May they sense your nearness as they begin the exploration of new paths. And by your grace, may they choose paths of wisdom. This we pray and ask in the powerful name of Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you guys. Have a great week.